subscribe. Hey y'all, welcome back. Today we are reviewing quadratic functions and we're answering a bunch of questions on the homework here. So the first one says, write an equation of a quadratic function in intercept form. So just a quick little reminder, what I mean by intercept form is this form right here, y equals, and then whatever your leading coefficient is, times x minus p times x minus q, where p and q are the x-intercepts. So this is also known as factored form. So sometimes you might see it called that, sometimes you see it called inter intercept form. Um, so anyway, uh, we want to find the equation that has the x-intercepts of 12 and 8 and passes through this point, 9, 5. Now the 12 and 8, you're going to plug right into p and q, um, but the a value, the leading coefficient, is not going to be explicitly stated here. You're going to have to use this coordinate, 9, 5, to sort of lock you into whatever this has got to be. So first things first, let's go ahead and fill in everything we know. We don't know the a value yet, so I'm going to leave that blank. Times x minus p and q. One is 12 and one is 8. doesn't matter which one's which. Uh, so we have x minus 12, x minus 8. And so this is all the information we have up front, but then they also tell us that the function's graph passes through this point. And so what that means is that 9 comma 5 is a solution to the equation, meaning if I plug in 9 for x and 5 for y, then uh, I'll have a true statement. Okay, so... I can go ahead and do that, plug this into x and plug this into y, just sort of temporarily, so that we can solve for a, and then we'll have our equation. So I'll go ahead and put 5 here, um, and then x is 9, so let's see here, so 9 minus 12 times 9 minus 8. Uh, at this point, we're just going to start simplifying, so 9 minus 12 is negative 3, and 9 minus 8 is 1, so that simplifies pretty nicely here. Uh, so uh, negative 3 times 1 is negative 3, so we have 5 equals negative 3a, and then we want to divide both sides by negative 3, so we get a equals uh, 5 over negative 3, or just negative 5 thirds. So that's going to be our leading coefficient there, and now we can actually write the equation and go back and uh, just fill in the a value here. So you can use y, you can use f of x. Um, not really a big deal which one you use. Um, I might use f of x here just to kind of switch it up a little bit from time to time. And uh, there we go. There is our function right there. It's got the correct y-intercepts. And if you go in, you plug in x, y, you're going to get a true statement here. Number two, you're given a function in this intercept form from number one. Um, so just recall that these two numbers are going to be the x-intercepts here. So 6 and 2 are the x-intercepts. Let's go ahead and graph those. Um, and I want to try to graph as much as I can before I start answering any of these questions. So let's see, we got one at 6. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And we got our another x-intercept at 2, 1, 2. The leading coefficient is positive, so I know it's going to be opening up. Um, I can see that the vertex is going to be on the axis of symmetry right in between these. So it's going to be at x equals 4. Not sure exactly where it is over here. Um, so we might have to actually figure that out. Okay, uh, But let's answer the questions that we know so far. Uh, the x-intercepts here are going to be at, let's see, 2 and 6. So that's uh, 2 comma 0 and 6 comma 0. Now, to get the y-intercept, we need to substitute 0 into x and then evaluate. So I'll do a little scratch work over here. So the y-intercept is going to be what we get when we plug in 0 into x. So 1 fourth, <clears throat> nope, not 14, <laughs> 1 fourth times 0 minus 6 times 0 minus 2. Whenever you do 0 minus something, it's just the negative version of that number. So 0 minus 6, for instance, is just negative 6. 0 minus 2 is negative 2. And so this is something that we can evaluate. All right? 6 times 2 is 12, and 12 divided by 4 is 3. So our y-intercept should be at 0, 3. And now we can go and actually plot that point as well. We can add that to the graph. Here we go. So 0, 1, 2, 3. 
Um, you know, because this is symmetrical, we actually are given another point here. So we know the axis of symmetry has got to be right in between the x-intercepts right here at uh, 4. So if we sort of reflect this point over that axis of symmetry, and let's see how many units it is away. 1, 2, 3, 4. If we go 4 units in the other direction, we can actually get another point. 1, 2, 3, 4. It doesn't really ask us for this point, but that can help improve the accuracy of our, our graph. So I'm guessing the vertex is probably going to be somewhere in here in order for this to open up correctly. So to find the vertex, um, there's a couple different ways we can do it. I think the easiest way at this point is to actually just substitute in. We know what the x value of the vertex has to be because it's got to be on that axis of symmetry, which is at x equals 4. right? It's got to be right in between here. Um, so what we can do is kind of like how we found the y-intercept is just plug in the appropriate x value. For the y-intercept, we plugged in 0 because the y-intercept is on the y-axis. But for the vertex, we want to plug in whatever the x value of the axis of symmetry is. So I'm gonna, we would plug in 4 here for x. Uh, so 4 minus 6 is going to be negative 2. 4 minus 2 is 2. So uh, this works out pretty good. Uh, we got 2 times 2 is that's 4. So this is negative 4 divided by 4 is going to be negative 1. And so, yeah, it does kind of look like it's going to be pretty close to where we were sort of estimating. I was sort of ballparking somewhere in here to make that parabola look like a, like a parabola. And it is, in fact, right here. Okay, so there's my vertex. I do have enough points here to sketch this, although never really turns out that great when I'm trying to draw a curve with a mouse. So just do the best I can here. Just focus on making sure those points are in the right place and you'll be all right. So if, to write this equation in standard form, what we need to do is actually multiply all of this together. So I've got um, f of x equals 1 fourth. I'm just going to rewrite the original equation here. And I'm going to uh, multiply the two binomials first and then I'll distribute the 1 fourth at the end. Okay, so the first thing I want to do is multiply these two things. Um, so that would give me, let's see here, be x squared, x times x is x squared, x times negative 2 would be minus 2x. Let's format this correctly. Uh, x times negative 6 would be negative 6x, and then negative 6 times negative 2 would be positive 12. So the only thing left to do to clean this up a little bit is to combine these two like terms right here. So we've got negative 2x minus 6x is negative 8x. And we're just about done. Remember, standard form here, and this might be a good, I guess I should have written that to begin with, but standard form here is going to be y equals ax squared plus bx plus c. You probably have that in your notes, but uh, not a bad idea to just kind of revisit it. So this is kind of like what... Uh, our answer should look like. Okay, so anyway, once we distribute that one-fourth, we get one-fourth x squared minus 2x uh, plus 3. And there we go. We got it in standard form. How about that? That is not, <laughs> that is not what I wanted. I wanted a rectangle there. There we go. Okay, well that's number two. Let's take a look at number three. So number three, we're trying to write an equation for this parabola. So we've got a couple things here we know. Um, actually, we can kind of solve this like we did the first one, because look, they give us both x-intercepts and a point on the curve. So actually, our like how we go about coming up with this equation um, is gonna be exactly the same. And they want it in factored form, and I guess that's a little bit of a hint on how to approach this. Uh, so I'm going to just kind of copy my work here, since the, uh, the structure of how I find this is going to be identical. We're just going to change the numbers to match uh, this particular problem. But uh, So they give us the two x-intercepts, and you can see they're negative 1, so I should have x plus 1, and uh, positive 7, so I should have x minus 7. And uh, they give us uh, an, another point on the curve, which is uh, 5, 3. So I'm going to put 5 as my x. Let's move these. And then this should be 3. So let me just like clean up the rest of these. So those are all 3s. 
Um, so here we've got 5 minus 12, which is going to be negative 7, and 5 minus 8, which is going to be um, negative uh, 3. Yeah? Oh, wait a minute. Pfft, I didn't fix the 1 and 7. So no. Let's try that again. 5 plus 1 and 5 minus 7. Jeez, that's what I get for copying and pasting so much. So, uh, yeah, no, this should be 6. And then 5 minus 7 is negative 2. So I get negative 12a. And then, so it looks like 3 divided by negative 12 is going to be a negative 1 fourth. So there's my a value, negative 1 fourth. And my two x-intercepts were uh, negative 1 and positive 7. So here we go. There's our equation. All right, so there's number 3. Now, it also says that we want to also write it in standard form. So we're going to have to, this, I guess this problem is kind of a combination of number 1 and number 2 here. Because not only did we have to find the equation in uh, the factored or intercept form, but now it's asking us to write it in standard form. So we've got to go through these. It's just really a couple of steps here to multiply all this together uh, to get our final answer here. So I'll start by multiplying the two binomials. Okay, so that would give me x times x, which is x squared. 1 times x is just x. Negative 7 times x is negative 7x. And then finally, 1 times negative 7 is negative 7. So if I combine these two like terms, I do get, um, I guess I could do this on the next step. Uh, oh, I don't need those parentheses there. Uh, okay, I get negative 6x. And, uh, oh, you know what? I forget, that's where, why I had those parentheses in there. I need to distribute that negative 1 fourth to, uh, to all that. So, yeah, we're not quite done yet. Don't forget about uh, multiplying that 1 fourth in there. So 1 fourth x squared, this would be, end up being, oh, hold on, we have an extra plus in there. So this would end up being uh, positive 6 fourths x, so 6 times a fourth is 6 fourths. That can be reduced to 3 halves. And then we've got uh, plus, um, what would that be, 7 fourths. So this would be the standard form. So we got the uh, factored form and the standard form. So uh, that's it for the first page. Let's take a look at um, some of these solving problems. With these uh, factoring problems, I can really categorize them in uh, two different groups. So uh, the first, which is like the easier way or the easier uh, equations to solve with factoring, are when you have a leading coefficient that's 1. Okay, so like all these six equations all have a leading coefficient that's 1. So we can kind of take the shortcut method. Um, but when we start getting uh, equations like the ones down here that have a leading coefficient that's not 1, we'll have to use um, a different method, okay? And the method that I'm gonna use for these is called grouping. So when we get to number 10, uh, I'll, I'll explain a little bit more how that works. But if your leading coefficient is one, then what you wanna do is rewrite this as a product of two binomials um, where you'll have like x plus something and then, or x minus something. Uh, each one will be kind of set up like that. And to figure out what those two somethings are going to be, um, we want to find two values that multiply to give us negative 24, uh, whatever the constant is, and then their sum needs to be whatever the coefficient of the linear term is, in, in this case, negative 2. So what I like to do is just set up like a little, um, like some scratch work out here where I'll say something times something equals negative 24, okay. And then some, those same two values need to add up to negative two. The reason I do this is it just, sometimes it's easier to have a little visual here to kind of keep track of what it is you're trying to find. Um, and so that, that's kind of why I, I like to write it like this. So I'm just going to take a moment, since we're going to have to do this for every single problem, and, and uh, just copy this for all these. Uh, I'm going to pause the video so you don't have to wait to do that. So um, in just a second, here we go. All right, and there we go. Check that out. 
Uh, magic. <laughs> All right. So two numbers that multiply to give me negative 24 and add up to negative 2. So I'm thinking of my factors of 24, and since it's got to be negative, um, I'm thinking about like the difference being 2, and that way I can just make the larger number negative and it should work out. So my factors of 24 are going to be like 1 and 24, 2 and 12, 3 and 8, and 6 and 4. So 6 and 4 have a difference of 2, so that, that, that's kind of my clue there. Um, and since they got to add up to negative 2, uh, the larger number needs to be negative. So we're going to have like negative 6 and positive 4, uh, if I can write those. <laughs> All right, you guys know I struggle with the mouse here. All right, so there's going to be our two sort of special numbers. So we've got x minus 6 times x plus 4. Those are going to be our two factors. And then once we have it factored, uh, then we have, we're have we kind of on easy street here. We're going to use something called the zero product property, which states that whenever um, we have two th expressions that have a product of zero, then... Uh, one of them at least has got to be zero. So we can kind of split the, we can use that property to split these up and say that either x minus 6 is zero or x plus 4 is zero. And then when we solve these individually, we'll get um, on the left hand side, if we add 6 on both sides, we'll get x equals 6. And if we subtract 4 from both sides on this equation, we'll get x equals negative 4. So my solutions are going to be x equals 6 or uh, negative 4. There's two solutions there. So that's going to be the process we go through on these first six problems. So uh, I, I might just kind of skip like straight to this. You know, this is a review of Algebra 1, so you've done this countless times. Um, and after you really get the hang of it, you don't really need to show every single individual step here. Uh, you really just want to show the factoring, and then you could probably just jump from there to the solutions. But uh, let's see how it works out with the next problem. So here we've got y squared plus 3y minus 18. So we're looking for two numbers whose product is negative uh, 18, uh, but whose sum is positive 3. So my factors of 18 are going to be 1 and 18, 2 and 9, uh, 6 and 3, which is going to be our, our winner here. So the negative has got to be the smaller number since our sum is positive. So we're going to have negative 3 and 6. I guess I'm going to have to handwrite those to make it fit in there. <laughs> negative 3 and 6. There we go. And this just takes practice coming up with these. You know, I know it's not the easiest thing to do to just, like, rattle off a bunch of factors off the top of your head, um, but it will get easier as you practice it more. So here we have got y minus 3 times y plus 6 equals 0. We'll use the zero product property to, uh, to find that our solutions are going to be 3 and negative 6. So notice how I kind of just skipped the, these intermediate steps. Um, but if you want clarification on how I get from here to here, just kind of look at how I worked out number 4. And that's got all the work shown. For number 6, we're looking for two numbers whose product is 28 and whose sum is 11. Uh, let's see here, my factors of 28 are going to be 1 and 28, 2 and uh, 14, no, that's not going to work, uh, let's see, 3 and 7, no, 4 and 7, my bad, uh, is 4 and 7 going to work here, 4, wait, yeah, 4 and 7, 4 and 7 is 11, yeah, there we go, so it's going to be 4 and 7. So 4 times 7 is 28, 4 plus 7 is 11. So our two factors are going to be uh, a in this case, not x, but a plus 4 times a plus 7 equals 0. So the two solutions here will be negative 4 and negative 7. For number seven, uh, we need two numbers whose product is 13 and whose sum is negative 14. Now, if you ever see one of these where like the sum is just like one bigger or one smaller than the product, then typically the, or I guess really every time, the two 
uh, the two numbers are going to be this thing it, itself in one, or it might be like a combination of you know one or more is negative. But if the difference between these two numbers is one, you can you can kind of use that shortcut. So yeah, I know it's going to be 13 and one, uh, but since they got to add up to negative 14, they've both got to be negative. So negative one and negative 13 is going to be our two special numbers here. Oh gosh, that's probably the ugliest three I've ever drawn. There we go. It's <laughs> not much better, but uh, I'm gonna just press on here. Uh, so we get, yeah, we get b minus one times b minus 13 equals zero. And so our two uh, solutions here are gonna be positive one and positive 13. For number eight, we're trying to multiply to 40 and add up to negative 13. So uh, since my sum is negative and my product's, um, uh, yeah, and my product is positive, then both numbers need to be negative. So I'm just keep that in mind. Uh, so we've got one and 40, it's not gonna work. Two and 20, nope. Uh, three, uh, four and 10. Wait a minute, is this even factorable? Four and 10 is not gonna work. Uh, five, oh wait, maybe it's five. Yeah, five and eight, okay, phew. All right, I thought maybe we had uh, one that was not factorable here. So, yeah, so it's going to be negative 5, negative 8. So our two factors are going to be C minus 5 times C minus 8. And you can always check these. If you're not 100% sure and you're just not feeling confident about your factors, you can always just FOIL these out and then See if it does, in fact, equal this. If it doesn't, you made a mistake. If it does, then you can rest assured you did it right. Um, so, yeah, if you're pretty confident, then you don't need to do that for every problem. But if there's any question at all, I really recommend multiplying these together and then just finding out, hey, is that actually right or not? So our two solutions here are going to be C equals 5 and C equals 8. For number nine, we're looking for two numbers that, oh wait, number nine's not set equal to zero. This is something we hadn't really have to deal with yet, um, but we do need this equation to be equal to zero. So what I need to do before I can really start anything is subtract that 5D from both sides so I know what my A, B, and C values are. So subtract that 5D over, and now we're looking for two numbers that multiply to give me negative 36 and add up to negative five. It's gonna be negative nine and four. Four, I believe. Yeah, that should work. So negative nine and four. Negative nine and four. There we go. Yep, that, that checks out. So my two factors are going to be d minus nine times d plus four. And then using the zero product property, we can establish that d equals nine or d equals negative four. All right, so those are all like the easy uh, kind of versions of these factoring problems. Where it becomes a little bit more challenging is when you've got uh, a leading coefficient that's not one. So to solve this, the first thing you want to do, like a number 10, is try to see if there's any GCS we can divide out. Uh, you want to make these coefficients as small as possible. It'll just work out a lot easier if you do that. Um, so like in this case, I can divide both sides by two, and we're still gonna have that leading coefficient, but our numbers will just be a, a tad smaller, and so it'll be easier to come up with um, uh, the, the, the steps to solve this. So, so to solve by grouping, and I'll kinda really walk you through number 10, and then for the rest, I'll just kinda you know, go through the motions. Um, the first thing you wanna do is you wanna try to split up this middle term, okay? And what I mean by that is we're gonna write this as a sum of two other terms. So like an example might be 1x plus 4x, or 2x plus 3x, or 10x minus 5x. And as you think of these different combinations, it won't take long to realize that there are infinitely many combinations of two different terms that can add up to 5x. But in order for this whole grouping process to work, there's only one combination that will, that will actually make this work. And so to come up with that combination, we go back to this whole product sum deal. Um, but it's just slightly modified, okay? 
So what we're gonna do is we're gonna find two numbers that multiply to give me the product of A and C, like two times three would be six, and whose sum is five. Now, really that's what we were doing before. Um, it's just that I never had to refer back to that A term because it was always one, right? So that's why I just pulled like the 40 uh, up here. But we do need to do the, the first times the last term to get that product, and then the middle term is what it needs to add up to. So you wanna think, in this case, of two numbers that multiply to give you six but add up to five, and those would be two and three. And so these are gonna be the coefficients of the two linear terms that we'll use to split up that middle term. So the first step here is always gonna to be to leave that first term alone, leave the last term alone, but split up this middle term into a sum of two terms. And those two specific terms need to, need to satisfy like these conditions with the, the, subtra the uh, addition and the multiplication. So here we've got 2x squared, and now I'm gonna pull from these terms over here, the 2x plus 3x, oops, and then the plus three just kind of falls down um, like the leading term did. Now the whole point of doing, of splitting this up is because this sets us up uh, so that we can actually factor by grouping here. So we're gonna group the first two terms and the last two terms. So um, you don't need to show this as a separate step usually, but basically what you wanna do is put parentheses around um, the first two terms and the last two terms. And then factor out the GCF or the greatest common factor of each of these two binomials. So for this one, um, the GCF is 2x. So we could divide that out, 2x. Oops. And so this would just be x uh, plus 1. And then we can factor out the GCF out of this one, which would be a 3. And we get x plus 1. And this is gonna be sort of like your checkpoint, okay? After you factor out the GCFs, you wanna stop here and check to make sure that what's inside the parentheses is exactly the same. And if it's not exactly the same, either you made a mistake or maybe you didn't actually find the GCF or something's going on. But if these are not the same, you need to stop and kind of look back over your work. If these are the same, then that means you're doing this correctly. I mean, unless you just like made a mistake and hap happen to be the same. Uh, but nine times out of 10, or 99 times out of 100, if these are the same, then you're on the right track. Uh, if, so, th so whatever is in parentheses there is going to be one of our factors, and then the other factor will be the combination of the GCFs. And what's really happening here, um, I don't really wanna confuse you too much, I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail here, but basically what's happening is we're factoring out this X plus one as a GCF. So we're kind of like undistributing this. We're taking it out of this and this, and that's gonna leave us with just two X plus three on the inside of the parentheses. So that's why the second factor is always uh, composed of uh, a combination of these leading coefficients, or uh, not leading coefficients, but the coefficients of each binomial. Now, once you uh, have this set up at, in factored form, which we do now, uh, we can do the same thing that we did up here, which is just basically to set each factor equal to zero and then solve. Um, so just like what I did with the examples above, I'll show, I'll show every single step on this first one, and then for everyone after this, I'll, I'll, I'll skip kind of the implied steps. So here we would get x plus one equals zero, uh, or we would get two x plus three equals zero. And so our two solutions here would be negative one or uh, negative three halves. So that's how you work out factoring by grouping. Um, you know, I, like I said on all the on all these later problems, I'm going to go through it a little bit more quickly. So if you get stuck or you're just like kind of confused, go back to this number ten, and uh, you know, just kind of revisit and try to try to make sense of all these steps I'm doing here. Um, so, okay, so let's do that uh, same thing with number 11. Looking at all the coefficients on number 11, I do not see a GCF, so I can't simplify it any further before I start, you know, uh, actually working it out. So uh, here I want two numbers that multiply to give me six, uh, which is two times three, and add up to give me seven. So that would be just six and one. Here's another case where those two numbers just differ by one, and so it's always gonna be like this number and one. 
Uh, so yeah, six times one is six, six plus one is seven, and this is gonna be the sort of magical way that we can split up that middle term, okay? So I'm gonna rewrite this as two x squared, and instead of writing seven x, I'm gonna write plus six x plus one x, and I don't really need the one here, but I'll just leave it there for now. Uh, now I'm gonna group the first two terms and the last two terms, so that's where I'm like right here, although I'm gonna do both of these in one step. Uh, my GCF, of the first two terms is gonna be two x, which leaves me with x plus three. And then the GCF of my second one is just one. So you gotta factor out something there. Uh, so it's gonna be a one. And that leaves me with x plus three. This is where we have our little checkpoint here and realize that, hey, these are both the same. Uh, so we are in good shape. We are doing it correctly. Uh, you should have a high degree of confidence that you're working this out correctly if those two things are the same. So that's gonna be one of our factors, and our other factors here is gonna be two x plus one. And using the zero product property, we can show that our two solutions are gonna be negative three and negative one half. And that's it for number 11. For number 12, uh, this one does have a GCF. We can divide out. Uh, I almost wanna divide out a six, but unfortunately 16 uh, is not a multiple of six. So we could divide it all by two. And so that will give me three uh, x squared minus 8x minus 3. Uh, unfortunately, that's as far as we can go there. But uh, we wanna find two numbers that multiply to give me negative 9, okay? And two num uh, so two numbers that multiply to give me negative 9 and add up to negative 8. Again, these differ by 1, so that's the clue that it's just gonna be 9 and 1. Uh, with the 9 being positive, I'm sorry, the 9 being negative, so negative 9, and the 1 being positive. So nine, negative nine times one and negative nine plus one. So that's gonna be how we split up that middle term. The three x squared and then minus three are gonna be the same. But instead of writing minus eight x, I'm gonna write minus nine x plus one x. Again, you don't really need the one there, but I'm gonna leave it there just to hopefully make the explanation clearer. At this point, we're gonna factor out the GCF of the first two group, uh, the first two terms and the last two terms. So the GCF of the first two terms is gonna be three X. So three X times X minus three. And then the GCF of the second one is gonna be one, which leaves me with X minus three. By the way, it doesn't really matter um, what order these two middle terms are in. You know, you could flip these and it's fine. Just make sure you, you factor out a negative uh, out of that second one. Uh, so anyway, this should equal zero. Um, so my two factors here are gonna be three x plus one and x minus three. So my two, uh, my two solutions here will be, looks like negative one third and positive three. That's number 12. Going down to number 13, we got three more um, until we start using quadratic formula. I know you guys are excited about that. Uh, so here we want two numbers that multiply to give me 18 and add up to negative nine. So finally we get one that's, you know, where these don't differ by one. Uh, so if they, if they multiply to be a positive and add up to a negative, that tells you that both numbers are negative. So when I'm thinking about these, I'm really just thinking of factors of 18 and looking for ones that add up to nine, and then I'll just slap on the negative sign at the end. So factors of 18 are one and 18, two and nine is not gonna work, but three and six will. Um, and since they need to add up to negative nine instead of positive nine, it's gonna be negative three and negative six. Again, the, the order doesn't really matter here. Okay, negative six, negative three will work just as fine. There we go. So I'm going to rewrite this equation as two x squared and I'll split up that middle term, negative three x, negative six x, uh, plus nine equals zero. The GCF of the first two terms is gonna be x, so if I factor out an x, it leaves me with two x minus three, and then the GCF of the second one will be, um, I, want them, I want them to be the same, so check this out. If I just factor out a three, and I, I forget to factor out like a, a, a you know, a, a negative here. If I factor out a three, so I'd have like plus three, and, uh, and I'm, what I would get is negative two x plus three, right? I'm just doing this just to kind of show you like what would happen. This is why we use this step as like a checkpoint. And I noticed, hey, these are actually not the same, right? 
So the reason they're not the same is because I did not factor out a negative three here. If I factor out a negative three, that will flip these signs and then fix that. So if, if you notice that every sign is just backwards, then just uh, factor out a negative as well and that should fix it up. So we get our two factors as two x minus three times x minus three. So it looks like our two solutions are going to be positive three halves and uh, positive three. For number 14, we need the two values to multiply to give me four and add up to five. So these differ by one. That's the, uh, the old number and one trick here. So if you have four and one, uh, so we got four times one is four. And then four plus one is five. So that's gonna be how we split up that middle term. Uh, no GCFs here, I forgot to look for that, but they're all prime, so no luck there. <laughs> it's just, numbers are already pretty small anyway, so it's not that big a deal. So we got four X plus one X plus two. Now we can split, I'm sorry, we, now we can group the, uh, the first two terms and the last two terms and factor out their GCF, which for the first two terms is 2x, and for the last two terms is just 1. We stop and verify that what's in parentheses is the same, and it is. We've got x plus 2 in both cases. So that is going to be one of our factors, x plus 2, and the other factor will be 2x plus 1. So our two solutions here will be negative two uh, and negative one half. We got one last factoring problem here. Now, this one's a little different. We had one kind of like this in this previous section where all the leading coefficients were one, uh, but like number nine, where it didn't actually equal zero up front. And so for all these quadratic equations, if you want to solve them, you really need it equal to zero. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull these two terms back to the left-hand side uh, by adding 12 to both sides and subtracting 14x from both sides. Uh, that'll leave me with 4x squared minus 14x plus 12 equals 0. Looks like I do have a GCF that I can divide out here to make those numbers a little smaller. Oops. I can divide both sides by 2. And that would make this a 2. That would make this, let's see, 14 divided by 2 is 7. 12 divided by 2 is 6. And yeah, 7 and 2 are both prime. No, no common factors here. So that's as far as we can go. So we want two numbers here that will multiply to give me 12, which is 2 times 6, and add up to negative 7. So I think our two numbers here are going to be negative 4 and negative 3. Right, negative three times negative four is positive 12, negative four plus negative three is negative seven. So that's gonna be our sort of magic combination here. So I'm gonna rewrite this as um, basically the exact same thing, except instead of seven X, I'm gonna write minus four X minus three X. I'm going to factor out a two X from the first two terms, which would leave me with two X I'm sorry, 2x times x minus 2, and then factor out a negative 3 out of the second group. So that would be x minus 2. The parentheses match up. We're in business here. So we get x minus 2 times 2x minus 3. So my two solutions here will be 2 and uh, positive 3 halves. And that wraps it up for factoring. Hopefully that was enough factoring practice to give you nightmares. Um, yeah, so keep practicing the factoring if you know you're really struggling with it, okay? It's just like one of those skills that, you know, your life will be a lot easier um, next year and for all your future math courses if you really get factoring down, uh, Pat. You were, oh, okay. We just, we lost our document there. Is it going to bring it back? I really hope so. Okay. Oh, gosh. We're really... 
Yeah, I'm struggling here. <laughs> okay, I guess I, I need to remember to cut this out the video, although I guarantee you I'm gonna forget. All right, there we go. Uh, where were we? Okay, so. And, uh, all right, there we go. So, <laughs> don't know exactly what happened there, but we get two and, and three halves. So yeah, just make sure you keep practicing factoring. If this wasn't enough practice for you, you know, do them again. If you need extra practice, let me know, because factoring is just like one of those things. You know, you could just Google factoring practice and there's a plethora of online um, help for you to where you can just get really, really good at this. Now, if factoring doesn't work or you just really hate factoring, you can always use the quadratic formula to solve quadratics as well. And that's what we're doing on this last page. So we got six problems where, you know, factoring may or may not work, but at the end of the day, I want you to actually use the quadratic formula to get our solutions. Now, just to, as a reminder, the quadratic formula is going to be negative b uh, plus or minus the square root of, oh, oops, wrong symbol, the square root of b squared minus 4ac all divided by 2a. And we'll use this formula every time, okay? So I'm going to copy and paste this for every problem. Uh, and we'll just fill in all the numbers as we need to. So for all of these, we're going to identify A, B, and C once we uh, set up the formula, uh, set up the equation correctly. So I'm going to just uh, make a little note here. A equals, B equals, and C equals. We'll figure out what all those coefficients are. And then we will use the quadratic formula uh, to actually get our solutions here. So I'm going to take a, a little a minute here um, to do some magic and uh, copy uh, this this little template here for all of these quadratic formula problems. And just like that, we are ready to go. So just like with the factoring problems, you do need the equation equal to zero. So I'm going to add 18 here on this first one. Another thing is you don't have to make the number smaller, but it is a lot nicer to have smaller values. So if you have a GCF you can divide out, go ahead and do that. Um, like in this case, we can divide everything by two to get x squared minus six x plus nine. Again, not a required step, but you know these numbers are a little smaller and they're gonna be a little easier to work with. So I'm just gonna lower this down since we had to do that. Um, in this case, the a, b, and c are gonna be the coefficients and the constant. Um, basically, like, just look, look at the, uh, the numbers in front. And so in this case, it would be like 1x squared, so a is 1, b is negative 6, c is 9. And then we can use those values to just plug them all into the uh, quadratic formula here. So x equals negative negative 6, which will be positive 6, plus or minus the square root of negative 6 squared, which is 36, minus 4 times 1, times 9. Now, 4 times 1 times 9 is going to be, oh, look at that, 36. Are you kidding me? <laughs> this one's only going to have one solution then. Uh, and then 2 times 1, which is just 2. So we want to simplify this a little bit, um, and I'll do that as a separate step. Uh, so we get 6 plus or minus the square root of 0. So this is plus or minus 0 over 2. Now, whether or not you add or subtract 0 from both sides, it's just going to be you know, it's going to be the same thing. 6 plus 0 is the equal to 6 minus 0. So it's really just 6. 6 over 2 is 3. So we get one solution of 3. But since we've talked about it in the context of polynomial functions, I'm going to make a note that this is multiplicity 2. Okay. That comes up, you know, basically what we know then is that the graph of the parabola is going to bounce off the x-axis at 3. So just, uh, it's, it's good to note that. Number 17, um, we've got some pretty large values here. I wonder if we can reduce this at all. So you can't divide by 5 because of that 16. And 4 is out of the question. 8, no, I don't think we can actually reduce that, unfortunately. We're just going to have some large numbers here. Um, okay, so negative b is going to be negative 40. 40 squared is going to be 1,600. And then we got 4 times 25, which is 100, times 16. Are you kidding me? Is this going to be another 100 times 16 is 1,600? Oh, my gosh. So this is going to be another one where you just get one solution. I really hope these are not all like that. But um, 
who knows? Two times 25 is 50. So this one works out to be uh, just about the same as the last one. We talked about what happens if this is zero, right? 1,600 minus 1,600 is zero. So we just get negative 40 uh, over negative 50. And it simplifies nicely. Negative 4 fifths. And that's it. And that's going to be another multiplicity of two. So this is another one where the vertex is on the x-axis. And it'll bounce off of there. For number 18, uh, this one is not in standard form yet. We gotta make it equal to zero. So we get five x squared plus seven x plus six. Uh, two to the three of those values are prime. There's no common factors here, so we're just gonna leave it like that. Oh, oops. So my a is five, my b is seven, my c is negative six. I'm oh, sorry, part of the positive six. Now we'll go through and plug everything in. So uh, let's see, if b is seven, 7 squared is 49. Uh, 4 times 5 would be 20 times 6 would be, let's see, 20 times 6 would be 120. So minus 120 over 2 times 5. Now check this out. Um, this is something we're going to get into next time uh, into a little bit more detail. But since it popped up here, if you ever get a negative number under your square roots, what that means visually is that this will never cross the x-axis. Um, but the way you're going to actually answer, like, what are the solutions here? First of all, let's subtract this. Uh, let's see, 40, 49 minus 120. Um, well, if we had 50 minus 120, that would be uh, negative 70. So 49 minus 120. Uh, there's going to be one more in that difference there. So uh, we should get... Uh, Let's see, uh, let me think one real quick. I'm trying to think and talk at the same time. Yeah, so 49 minus 120 should be negative 71. So this would be 10. Uh, yeah, 2 times 5 is 10. I guess I should put that there too. So this is a, a non real number. Okay, so like back in Algebra 1, you probably just said, you probably just quit there and say, oh, it's not real. But since we've talked, you've talked about imaginary numbers back in Algebra 2, and we're actually going to discuss them a little bit more in our, uh, in our Algebra Review Part 3 uh, in the next lesson. Might as well just give you a little preview on what, you know, how to actually write this. Is we're going to factor out a negative 1 out of this square root. Um, and the square root of negative 1, we're going to write as the imaginary number i. So i, just as a little, little preview here, i is the square root of negative 1. We'll talk about that a little bit more next time, but any time you've got a negative number under your square root, you've got to pull that out, um, and, then, and then you can be done. Okay. So these are not real numbers. They are complex numbers. Uh, uh, because they have that negative square root in there. Um, and so, like I said, we'll talk about that more a little bit more next time, but that would be how you write your solutions. For number 19, moving right along here, we got no common factors to divide out, so my A is just going to be 2, my B is going to be negative 1, and my C is going to be positive 2. Let's go ahead and plug all that in. I'm going to plug in negative 1 right here. Negative, negative 1. The opposite of the opposite of 1 is just 1. Uh, B squared is just going to be 1 squared is 1. So it's negative 1 squared. I got a bad feeling about this. Minus 4 times 2 times 2. Yeah, we're going to get another non-real solution here, aren't we? Yep. Sure are. Okay, that's because 4 times 2 is going to be 8, and 8 times 2 is 16. So yeah, just like on the last one, we do we are going to end up with a negative square root in there, which, um, you know, it is what it is. It's just something else to have to deal with. That's life, right? When life hands you a uh, complex number, you make, uh, yeah, I don't know. I'm trying to think on the spot. There's, there, there's a joke in there somewhere. Okay, so yeah, so we factor out that negative 1, and so we're just going to write that as i. And that's it. There we 
go. All right, number 20. Okay, I'm, I'm crossing my fingers for no more uh, ira uh, imaginary values. We haven't had one yet that just had straight up two solutions, two real solutions. That's kind of, uh, I don't, that's, that's weird. But, um, okay, crossing my fingers that it happens on this one. Let's see if we can get lucky here. So we got negative, negative 6, which is going to be positive 6, plus or minus. Uh, 6 squared is going to be 36. 4 times 8 times 1. Okay, well, 8 times 1 is just 8, right? Okay, so we are going to get something useful here. So 4 times 8 is going to be 32. 2 times 8 is going to be 16. Um, yeah, so we can simplify this, and we are going to get two. Uh, they're going to be irrational. Um, that's okay. Remember the factoring technique, which is really cool and useful and easy once you get the hang of it. Um, it only works really if, if, I mean, it only reasonably works if your two solutions are rational. But if they're irrational, like square root of five or something like that, then you're going to be stuck using the quadratic formula. Uh, there is another method called completing the square, which I briefly went over in the notes, um, which you can use, but I think quadratic formula is just, if you know the formula, it's just so much easier. You take all the guesswork out of it and uh, just follow the steps. 36, oh, this one looks like uh, it, <laughs> we're not going to get an, oh my gosh, all right, we're actually not going to get an irrational on this after all. The square root of 4 is 2. So we end up getting rational values. And what that tells me is that this one could have been factored. Um, yeah, so we get 6 plus 2 over 16. So I'm going to write these separately. x equals 6 plus 2 over 16, and then 6 minus 2 over 16. I really split this up to help, help me uh, do the arithmetic uh, mentally here. So 6 plus 2 is 8, and 6 minus 2 is 4. So 8 over 16 reduces to 1 half, and 4 over 16 reduces to a fourth. So that means that this one we could have factored. Uh, but, you know, the directions asked us to use the quadratic formula, so we did. Okay. We got one last problem here that we need to put into standard form first. We're going to do that by subtracting 8x and adding 3 to both sides. So there we go. Now we're set up and ready to go. There's no common factors here for us to divide out. So a is 2, b is negative 8, and c is 3. So we get negative negative 8, which uh, translates to positive 8. We get um, negative 8 squared, which is 64. 4 times 2 times 3 over 2 times 2. So let's clean this up a little bit. 4 times 2 is 8. And 8 times 3 is 24. And then 2 times 2 is 4. 64 minus 24 is going to be 40. Okay, so we're finally going to get an irrational here. Great. Um, at this point, I'm fine with you leaving it like this. Uh, you know, that... that, that that does express the two solutions. Um, in our next lesson, uh, we're going to review how to simplify these square roots. But if you recall, um, either from our very first unit, unit 0 from back in the beginning of the year, or even from Algebra 2, if I divide out a 4 here, the square root of 4 is 2. And that leaves me with a 10 under here. And then I can actually reduce all the rest of these numbers. Oops. So if you really want this to be in truly reduced form and divide all these by 2, you get 4 plus or minus 1 times the square root of 10 over 2. And then some, uh, you know, that's mostly acceptable. I know there's some textbooks that will want you to go even further than that, say it's 2. Um, 2 plus or minus, I don't really know that there's a whole lot of advantage to writing it like this, but just so you can see it, uh, 2 plus or minus root 10 over 2, or like 1 half root 10. Again, not a lot of advantage to writing it like that, but um, that you might see it written like that. So that's it for today. Um, we did a little bit of everything for quadratic functions. We did some graphing. Uh, we did some writing equations. We did some solving using factoring, some solving using quadratic formula. So we really like, uh, we really went over a lot in this lesson. Um, so if you have any questions, as always, please reach out. I'm here to help you. 
Uh, but otherwise, y'all have a great day, and I'll see you next time.